Howdy, y'all. Joe Hills here, recording as I often do in Huntsville, Alabama at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Just kidding. I'm never here. Look at this. This is a rocket. It's awesome. I'm really excited. I've been invited here today to go on a secure, behind-the-scenes tour of the Marshall Space Flight Center, as well as the public-facing areas of the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Let's go on in. While everyone waited to get their secure access badges, I got to look at all sorts of cool displays, like these mission medallions from the Apollo, Skylab, and Space Shuttle missions, as well as this awesome primitive flying machine, which somehow stays in the air, even though its motor isn't running at the moment. These NASA folks are pretty clever. Once we were appropriately badged, we boarded the shuttle, or the Space and Rocket Center shuttle, which really, I think, should be called just the Space Shuttle, but, you know, I'm not a marketeer. And then we passed through the gate of the Redstone Arsenal that the Marshall Space Flight Center shares with the U.S. Army. And let me tell you, as pretty as the Davidson Center is and the outward-facing facilities NASA owns are, they do not waste taxpayer money on buildings inside the base. Look how functional this building is. Would I want to work somewhere that looks like that? Of course I would. It is NASA. But why waste money painting buildings when you could be developing new kinds of additive manufacturing for rocket engines? Before letting us wander around and touch all the cool expensive stuff, Todd Mays, the newly appointed director of the Marshall Space Flight Center, stopped by to talk to us. He spoke a lot about the cool things I'll be showing you shortly, but one of his most interesting points about NASA's mission is that they go where no one else can or can't afford to go. Private space flight is pretty exciting, but we can't just shut down NASA and let them handle everything because it's not economically viable for them to push frontiers in the way government programs can. Once NASA and its international partners establish a foothold somewhere beyond Earth, like the International Space Station, private spaceflight companies become viable financially, shuttling materials, and someday people, to them. So, in short, what he said was, NASA will go where there are no markets, and let the markets follow at their own pace, which I think is pretty cool. Now, the first labs we got to visit was the Systems Integration Lab and the Software Integration and Test Facility. As you can see, they built racks that model the actual layout of the inside of the space launch system by placing the flat computers and other electronic components where they'd actually go in the real SLS. They can discover problems like timing issues caused by specific cable lengths or electromagnetic interference between the devices that they couldn't discover testing the components individually. While they obviously test how the components would respond under ideal conditions, they said they spend most of their time on diabolical testing where they try to imagine situations where the components might fail and create simulations to test them under those adverse conditions. Now, it's really impressive. The resolution of these simulations is 400 hertz. That's 400 ticks per second, as folks who play video games might think of simulation running techniques. And this creates so much data. It's crazy. And they immediately upload all of it and share it with other labs working on these components as well after every run. So that way everyone's always up to date for looking at possible flaws in the system or places to improve. Now next, we went even further behind the scenes into an even more secure area of an already secure military base to visit the test stands where rocket engines are fueled and fired with the actual propellants that will be used in flight. We're talking hydrogen, we're talking methane, all sorts of things that you do not want to put in your coffee. First, we ascended the test stand where the Saturn V rocket's F-1 engines were fired. These test stands had to withstand up to a million pounds of force. Think about how much a rocket wants to move away from the propellant being fired out the back of it, and how strong a structure has to be to keep it in place. These are serious construction jobs. Now, let's take a minute to appreciate my face when the camera is too close to it. Okay, I'm on top of the test stand that they use for the Saturn V rocket. If you look behind me here, you can see the test stand that they're constructing for the new SLS rocket, which is a space launch system. My eyes are way too close to this camera. I'm not at all comfortable with it. So I'm standing right now in the test stand that was used for the Saturn V rocket. They actually put like uh, Saturn V F1 engines inside of here and then fired them. And they fired them straight down. Oh, that doesn't sound good. You know, you need a place for the excess heat to go. So I think that went down into here. And they've got a crazy chute thing that I don't know that I can walk out to. You know what? This does not look safe. I, you know, see how it says danger? We're not gonna walk over there. I got a still photo that I took earlier. Let's cut to that. Those down there are the hydrogen tanks where they keep the liquid hydrogen. You're not supposed to smoke next to them or in restaurants or really anywhere near your lungs these days. We escaped the biting cold and visited the flat floor 
where Les Johnson, NEA Scout's solar sail principal investigator and his team showed off a small CubeSat, or Cube Satellite, that will serve as one of the 13 secondary payloads for the Space Launch System's first exploration mission in late 2018. These 13 secondary payloads are each about the size of a shoebox and will be deployed from these racks in the secondary stage of the launch vehicle. Secondary payload, secondary stage. Easy to remember. Thanks, NASA. The Near Earth Asteroid Scout, or NEA Scout, will deploy a solar sail four times as large as the one on display here and fly slowly past an asteroid to collect data on it and relay that data back to Earth. The solar sail basically steals momentum from photons provided by the sun for free. See, they're, they're watching their bottom line. So the NEA Scout isn't limited by fuel constraints or lining up gravity assists and launch windows, but rather it's limited by the expected lifespan of the sail itself. If the sail holds up well, they might even be able to loop back around and take additional passes on the asteroid, gathering more data from different angles, which would be ludicrously expensive with conventional propellants. Now they also let us ride out on their flat floor, which you can see here. It's an incredibly smooth treated floor they use for working on heavy things they know they'll need to move around a bit. They push air from an external tank through a hose and out into the feet of special pallets or the fancy triangle couch chair thing you see I ride in the next video. Now you're flying at about half the thickness of a sheet of printer paper. Half the thickness of a sheet of printer paper. So it just makes it so like, you got We can simulate X and Y. It weighs 4,000 pounds and it has four ounces of drag. And this is just air pressure? or is Your, It's a precision epoxy floor. There's three air bearings and you're and the air pressure is about 35 pounds. Basically what's in your car tire is what it takes to flow. And as you can tell, I will never pan so smoothly with an iPhone camera again. That was such a weird experience, feeling like I'm just perfectly floating in the X and Y axis. It's bizarre. You'd have to do it. Now, did you know that all of the United States' science payloads on the International Space Station are managed out of Huntsville, Alabama? I didn't, but you do now, so you're better than I was a week ago. I hope you take some pride in that. Now, there wasn't time for us to visit the Payload Operations and Integration Center, but when we got back to space camp, some of the folks who talked to astronauts daily there took the time to talk with us aboard the space camp's ISS simulator. We got to see some of the foods the astronauts eat from all over the world, the sort of space they have for their sleeping quarters, which isn't much, and where they work. Fun fact, apparently everything the ISS astronauts say on the radio can be heard in similar operation centers all over the world. So if they want to chat with their families or ask the operation center something non-mission critical, they can call on a voice over IP phone aboard the space station that then gets routed down through Houston and then doesn't show up on your caller ID properly. So if you've ever wanted to get a call from a random number with a Houston area code, put them on hold immediately because you're really busy getting something out of the oven or you got something you got to take care of, and then when you pick it back up, they say, Hi, this is so-and-so calling from space. Well, let me tell you, this is the job for you. Our final stop of the day was the home of the Sally Ride EarthCam Image Processing Center. The EarthCam is a fancy camera pointed out the window of the International Space Station that takes photos of places on Earth as requested by students across America. If you're an American elementary schooler, you can bug your teacher about having your class take pictures from space. And if you're not, you can still check out the photos in their gallery, which are all released into the public domain. Wow, we learned a lot today. And you can learn even more with the links in the description below. Until next time, y'all, this has been Joe Hills from Huntsville, Alabama. Keep adventuring.